let us go to prayer before we go into God's Word. Heavenly Father, it is a wonderful privilege to come before you, to know you, Lord, and to hallow your name. Lord, and we come to you in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for this opportunity that we have to fellowship with one another, even though we may be quite a ways apart outside of this building, delayed time. But Lord, this is your word nonetheless. This is our opportunity for fellowship nonetheless. And I ask for your blessing. I ask for your presence. I ask for your leading. I ask that those who are listening would be encouraged in your word. And that they also would sense your wonderful presence. That we will rest in your peace. Oh, it's that peace that surpasses all understanding. It's that peace that we are longing for and looking to in our relationship with Jesus. That guards our hearts and minds in our Savior. I ask you, Lord, to meet each need. And to help each of us to be involved in helping to meet the needs of others as you give us the opportunity to do so. May we learn all the more to be salt and light in the world. Thank you for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy. In the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. I want us to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 6. I'm going to be reading from Hebrews 6, verses 13 to 20. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to encourage you today at this time. And we must also encourage one another. We must encourage those who we come in contact with, maybe by phone or however God brings people into your life. As Christians, we should be encouraging. We may be living in a more confined life at the moment, but nevertheless, the Lord is in control, and we are to carry on and conduct ourselves as the true church of Jesus Christ. And that means in whatever form or fashion we are able to. And know this, that the kingdom of God is still advancing. Yes, it is still advancing today, even in all that is going on in our world as a result of the coronavirus. That doesn't stop the kingdom. That doesn't stop the power of God. That should be to us an opportunity to allow our faith to be tested and to trust God. So I want to encourage you today I want to encourage you in this moment to not fear, but to trust God. God will keep His Word. 
We can trust God. Those whose faith is in Jesus Christ should not fear the happenings that we hear and see around us. Oh, we may have a tendency to entertain fears and doubts of various kinds, but we as Christians must not and should not succumb to them and give way to these fears and doubts. It is in trying times like these that we must know beyond the shadow of any doubt to whom we belong and that, it, that in Him and through Him, that is Jesus Christ, we have His Word. And His Word is sure and true. We can stand on it. We can believe it. We can trust it. We can put our faith in it. And we know that God is going to accomplish His Word. God has given to His church, collectively and individually, the certainty of His promise. And in Jesus, he assures the church individually and collectively. I'll add it again. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And again, I remind you that in, I am in Jesus. In Jesus, therefore, qualifying the fact that you and I have a relationship with God because we are in Jesus, we have been born again, we have been ransomed, we have been redeemed. We belong to Him, and we have been sealed as children of God by His blessed Holy Spirit. Grace and mercy has found us. Grace and mercy covers us. We need that grace and mercy every day. We are in Jesus, and when we are in Jesus, we are in His salvation, we are in His righteousness, we are clothed in Christ. That's for the Christian, that's for the believer. It tells us here in Hebrews chapter 6, for when God made a promise to Abraham, talking about the certainty of God's promise, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, he says this to Abraham, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. Now, now we, we need to get that. God made a promise to Abraham. He declared an oath to Abraham. And he said to him the simple, the simple few words, I will bless you and multiply you. And we know that if we go back to Genesis and we start reading about this promise that God gave to Abraham, he said that the nations of the world will be blessed through him. And we find that as we come to faith in Jesus Christ. God keeps His promises, and we can trust Him to do that. Another thought I want to give you. We can put our faith in Him because Jesus is the founder and perfecter of our faith. He is the founder. He is the initiator. He is the origin. He comes to us, He helps us, He leads us, He inspires us, He motivates us in faith. In faith, His faith, He gives to us, He is the founder, and He will perfect that faith in you and me. We can trust Him. We may think, well, I don't have enough faith right now to trust Him. Then you need to pray and ask the Lord to help you in your weakness that you can trust God and you can cast yourself for long in faith because He is the founder and He is the perfecter of faith. You didn't initiate that faith. We know that. It goes on to tell us here in Hebrews 6, for people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. The oath between them is final for confirmation. 
So when God desired to show more convincingly, convincingly, more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So not only was God declaring to Abraham with a word of promise and an oath, he was wanting and desiring to show it more convincingly to those who would be heirs of the promise given to Abraham thousands and thousands of years ago that is, that is powerful and true and applicable today for you and me as Christians. God has guaranteed his promise with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We as Christians, this is leading us now, this is going to teach us how we can find our encouragement in this promise and in this oath that God gave to Abraham so many thousands of years ago. It's for you and for me. It's for the church of Jesus Christ, for, for the individual and for the church as a whole. We can live in that and we can walk in that faith. One commentator says, he says this, In human affairs, the oath confirms what is said and puts an end to all argument. So God used this particular form of speech to make the unchanging nature of his promise very clear to those who were the heirs of what was promised. He used two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, namely his promise and his oath. These are the two unchangeable things about God, His promise and His oath, to give the greatest possible encouragement to His people to put their trust in Him. You can trust God today. You can trust God for tomorrow. You can trust that God has all things in control. Do you believe that? You need to ask yourself that. Do I really believe that today? It's so easy to trust God when we're in a church service and around other believers where we have the music and the singing and the preaching and teaching of God's Word. It's easy to say, I have faith. And it's because we are attached to that experientially and emotionally. But in times like this, when we are separated one from another and things look as though it could go on for quite a while like this, then we need to ask ourselves, do I have that same faith and trust in God now? In the darkness of night, on the rough seas of life, is Jesus in the boat with me? And if he is, just sit back and hold on and enjoy the rough ride. We're going to make it because God is in control. It is clear, this, this commentator says, from what follows that we who have fled to take hold of the hope offered to us in Jesus are the ultimate heirs of what was promised to Abraham. We are the heirs because of what Jesus did at the cross and through the empty tomb. We are heirs not because we have been born into Jewish lineage, but because we have been born into Christ. Christ is our hope. Christ is our source. Christ is our redemption. He is our redemption. It tells us in Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 to 29. For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God. Let me, let me say that again. We've talked about the word in a little earlier. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Through faith. It's saying everything that I've just talked about and what scripture is showing us here. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. Through faith. 
It has to be through faith, right? We can't earn it through our physical works. We can't decide tomorrow morning that we're going to wake up and we're going to be a Christian tomorrow. We're going to start going to church. That's our initiative. No, I'll tell you what that is. That is the Holy Spirit working on someone's heart to get them to come and surrender their life to Him. But you can never do it in your own strength. We must have faith to believe because we are lost. We are in sin without God. And we are destined for an eternity without Him. But here it's saying, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. It tells us again, let me, let me remind you of what it says in, in John. John chapter 1 and, and, and verse 12, I believe it is. It says this, But to all who did receive Him, to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name. Catch these very important words to what is being said. Who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Not everybody is a child of God. Not everybody in the world is a child of God. You are not a child of God until you come to Jesus and then you go to the Father. You can call Him Abba, Father, God, because of Jesus. We begin there. So He tells us here, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. For as many as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, now listen to this, and if you are Christ and you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise, I believe that it is John Stott who says that in Christ we are all one society, we are Christians, we aren't black or white, we are Americans or Europeans, we are Christians, we are one society. He says there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ. Now, now here is the connection to the promise of Abraham. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So we can trust God. We are born again. We belong to God. We are heirs of the promise. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. The Christian is the true offspring of Abraham. Well, I don't have any Jewish blood in me, that I know of anyway. But I am an heir to the promise of Abraham because I know Jesus Christ. So here we have God's promise and God's oath. And God does not lie, he says. We have these, this, these two things he's saying here in Hebrews chapter 6. These two things, his promise and, and his, his oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie. God never lies. He has come to rescue us through the cross from the one who is a liar and the father of lies, Satan. The enemy of the cross, the enemy of the church, the enemy of Jesus Christ. Paul calls him a roaring lying, roaming about seeking whom he may devour. But in Christ, we don't have to worry about that. In Christ, as we follow Christ, we can trust God's word. We can trust God's promise. We trust God's oath because God does not lie. God does not sin. He keeps his promise. Amen. Amen. Romans 8 and verse 3 says, For God has done what the law, weakened in the flesh, could never do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. As a Christian, you should never walk around feeling condemned. Because 
Christ has come to condemn one thing, and that one thing is he condemned sin on the cross, and he became victor over death, hell, and the grave for those who would believe and call upon his name. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes, as a condition in the verse, you must believe, whosoever believes should not perish, but have everlasting life. You can only we have real, eternal, super abundant life if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And Christian brother and sister, we can trust God. We need not fear. We need not give in to and entertain fears and doubts. We must not succumb to them. We must quickly say, Lord, Thank you for this time. Thank you for all that I am going through. I find joy in meeting the trials of various kinds. We know that. James tells us to do just that, doesn't he? James tells us, count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know, now listen, that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. There, there's, there, there's a line of God's virtues that he wants to give to every child of God. That when we meet trials of various kinds, I'm not saying we become slap happy, that we stumble over everybody in laughing. No, we're talking about real joy. It's not something that is temporary. Happiness is a temporary word. Happiness points to something that is temporary. Happiness depends on the conditions around me. Everything must be right to keep me happy. But in Jesus, when we know in whom we have believed and we can trust him because of his promise and his oath, we can know that joy that the Bible says the recipient, those who know Jesus Christ, have. We have it. The Christian has it. Real joy that sees us through the storms of life. That sustains us and becomes our steady in all things. And we can trust the Lord for it. God did in Christ through his son. You see, the law came to, to reveal sin to us. The law could not save us. The law of Moses could not save us. All of that sacrificial system and, and bringing the goats and the bulls and the lambs and the different things that they had to do to make atonement for their sins, they had to do it over and over and over again. The, the, the high priest at that time, he had to make atonement for his own sins. Then he'd make atonement for the sins of all the people and he would have to do that yearly. But the law could not save. The law could not save. It was a demonstration of following duty according to the law, that a person might find themselves righteous before God, and that was only temporary. Jesus came. Jesus came, and he fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law, it tells us in Romans 8. So when we are in, in Christ, because we have been born again, the righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us because Jesus fulfilled it, and we are in Jesus. And God condemns sin in the flesh by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He who knew no sin, Jesus, became sin for us. He who knew no sin took all of my sin and all of my shame and, and Isaiah tells us, He took every affliction to this body as a result of the curse of sin and He nailed it to the cross. So I... I encourage you in the hope that we have in Jesus. I know we may have a natural tendency to oftentimes give way to fears and doubts, but do not spend your time there. I encourage you don't spend your time there. Shut the TV off if you have to. Stop listening to the news if you have to, and instead get into God's Word and get on your knees before God. We need God's grace and we need God's mercy each and every day. 
Jeremiah says, and he wrote in Lamentations, His compassions they fail not, they are new every morning. His mercies they fail not, they are new every morning. The mercy I have today is not going to be like the mercy I have tomorrow. It's from the same source, but it's richer, it's deeper, it's greater. And we can trust God for that. We can be assured that God will meet us as we come to Him, as we trust Him, because He, he knows us thoroughly, doesn't He? And He knows exactly what we need as a body of Christ and as an individual. God knows exactly what we need. He knows what you need today. He knows what's troubling your heart. He knows what's on your mind. And He doesn't want you to embrace that and hold that all to yourself. He wants you to quickly cast all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. God loves His children. I love my children. I love all my children dearly. When I say all my children, I'm talking about my, my son-in-law, my daughters-in-law, my grandchildren. All of I love my children. I wouldn't hesitate in a moment to give my life to them as the ultimate sacrifice of my love for them. But the Word of God says if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? God loves us even more than what we can realize. God's love goes far beyond my conditional sense of love and understanding. And I'm glad for that. Aren't you glad you've experienced the unconditional love of God? Huh? I am. I am so thankful for that. God will sustain you. God will see you through. Trust Him child of God. Trust the Father. Trust His promise. Trust His Word. May we be reminded of who we are in Jesus Christ. We are heirs of the promise. God has all that is going on in His control. We can trust Him. You think this coronavirus blindsided God? Really? Do you think um, all that's going on in the world in China and, and, and Paris and France and, and uh, the United States and Canada all over the world on every continent, you think this took God by surprise? Are you kidding? We need to know that God is sovereign. Isn't God sovereign? Isn't God sovereign? He works all things, it tells us. I believe it's in Ephesians 1, 11. He works all things according to the counsel of His will. We can trust Him. You see, no matter what the situation is, child of God, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how grievous it gets, God is working good in that situation. God is working good in this situation. It's interrupted people's lives. It's interrupted people's vacations and travel plans. It's interrupted work schedules and businesses, restaurants and all of everything is coming to a standstill. It's affected economies all around the world. This hasn't surprised God. But listen, church, God is working all things according to the counsel of His will. And God is going to work good in and through His children through this. Trust God for that. That's God's Word. That is God's Word to us. Hebrews 6, again, I take you back to Hebrews 6, verses 19 and 20. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We go back to the Old Testament, we read about this Melchizedek who met Abraham. And Abraham paid a tithe to him. In other words, when Abraham paid a tithe of him of, of all that he had received uh, as a plunder from the war he was just in, that was saying that this Melchizedek was greater than him. Abraham paid him a tenth of everything, a tithe of everything. We know nothing about this Melchizedek other than he was king of Salem, priest of God, high priest of God. We don't have, he had no beginning, 
and he had no end. That's as far as I go with that. We can speculate a number of things. But Jesus, it says here, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, he has become a priest forever. He is our high priest today. And we have God's promise. We have God's word. And it is a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. I feel, I, I grieve in my heart for those who are not serving Jesus Christ. Because they have no peace of God. They don't know the joy of God. They live in fear of life and death. And the Christian shouldn't. We have a sure anchor of our soul. We have it in our high priest, Jesus. He tells us that he will never leave us nor forsake us. He tells us this in Hebrews 13, verses 5, the last part of verse 5, and, and I want to read verse 6 there as well. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now I want you to think about that for a moment. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? Jesus said, do not fear man who gives life or death to the body, but fear God who gives life or death to the soul. We are to look to God. We are to have a reverent fear of God and God only. We're not to be afraid of God. We fear God for who he is, almighty creator of heaven and earth. He gave you and me this physical life. He created us. He spoke it and the worlds were, were formed. He spoke substance into existence. That baffles the scientists, doesn't it? Because they say you can have nothing without substance, yet God spoke it and the substance was there and it came together. We have an intelligent designer. If I dare use that terminology, it is God Almighty. He is our helper. The Lord is our helper. I will not fear. Doesn't the psalmist also remind us of that in one sense when he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 